Hello. Good to see you. I don't know about you, but I've been enjoying a beautiful spring day today. It's absolutely uh, streaming in the sun today. And I was thinking, well, I need, obviously, to come up with a piece of music that is uplifting, that reflects the joys of spring. Um, what would you have chosen, I wonder? I mean, Vivaldi's up there, isn't it? Immediately springs to mind. Rite of Spring. Stravinsky, a bit heavy, maybe, uh, for these days. Uh, I thought of Appalachian Spring by Aaron Copeland. He wrote it in... So they were in the deepest, darkest days of World War II, and yet he comes out with this remarkably positive and beautifully simple, appealing score. And it's a score for a ballet with the choreographer Martha Graham, whom he greatly admired. So I've always loved this score and I had the opportunity to conduct it with the Bristol Ensemble actually a couple of years ago, more than a couple now, in Colston Hall. And it was one of the most enjoyable concerts that I can remember. Really a beautiful, beautiful experience. The orchestra just uh, plumbed it for all its beauty. It really, really was lovely. I hope you were there maybe, I don't know. So it's always been a favourite of mine. Just listen to how it starts. And then this chord, right? Isn't that beautiful? I could wax lyrical about that chord. I might, I might later. But if I were just to show you my hands, does that make you think of um, a butterfly? I hope it does. That's the shape of it. It's a perfect mother nature type chord, full of openness, isn't it? And promise and serenity. This is actually the mother reflecting on the joys of youth right at the beginning of the ballet at this stage. So what Copeland did was he took the ballet score and edited it down to this orchestral version. The original score was 13 instruments. They couldn't afford anymore uh, for the um, orchestral pit and the ballet. Uh, but then he expanded it to a full orchestral version. But he uses the orchestra in a very lean, typically Copeland way. You know, it's very economical and that's part of its simplicity. Now, I hope you've noticed that I've used that word simplicity several times because that's going to be the theme of this talk. Simplicity. How does he make it so simple and yet effective? Because like many things, things that appear simple actually um, are hiding a wonderful uh, profound set of secrets and uh, this, this wonderful depth of craft and uh, a sense of expression of what he wanted to say about the story that was given to him by Martha Graham. Now she didn't give him actually much of a story to go on. Um, before I tell you what she did give him, the first idea, and I find this quite amusing given what we've ended up with, was to do a ballet on the subject of Medea. Can you imagine that? Medea, the Greek tragedy full of blood and revenge and bitter rage. And I think Copeland's words were, were it's, it's rather severe, maybe, <laughs> for a ballet, particularly in 1945, where we need hope um, and aspiration at this time in America. So she came back with, why not tell a story about the roots of American values, about the pioneering spirit, about a young couple aspiring to a good life in the countryside. And that developed into this vision of the Quaker or Shaker community living in the Pennsylvanian mountains. So when we think of Appalachian Spring, I suppose the spring in that title relates not just to the season, because there are lots of fresh spring-like colours in this. When I hear it, I think of like blues and yellows and greens and all that kind of thing but also to that sense of new roots spring being the source of something new of a new life of a couple together of new values that they're building together in a community so let's go back to that word simplicity before i dive into the music itself and um i want to think about the personalities involved here, the core collaborators, so Martha Graham, the choreographer, and Copeland. 
So something that Copeland was very drawn to in Martha Graham's style was her pared back gestures, how clean everything was, how direct everything was, and that greatly appealed to him. Not least, I suspect, because, you know, that's the way he thought and wrote. I don't know if you've heard Copeland give an interview ever, but he comes across, certainly in his later age, as very sort of avuncular, very natural, very direct and simple in that sense. He's not trying to sort of cloak his sentences with grand words, but also very erudite, you know. Um, so he has that wonderful ability when he speaks to mix the vernacular with the academic and make things wonderfully clear and yet profound. And I think that's what we're hearing, you know, the way he thinks and speaks is the way he composes. So, um, should we just have a look at the, the score and how it begins? Now, it didn't actually begin with that mother chord, as I'm going to call it, but, and you'll probably know this, a rather famous tune, The Gift To Be Simple. It's a shaker hymn, and um, it's been sort of uh, put to the Lord of the Dance, those words. I'm sure you'll know it from that as well. You know, when you get to the middle of it, I hope you feel like springing up out of your chair. You know, it's, it's got that sort of sprung quality because it's meant to be danced to. I didn't realise this, but I, I read this recently that these Shaker hymns, and it was written in about 1858, were meant to be danced to, and particularly to be spun to. They talk about turning, so this kind of folk dance style. And the words, the original words, not the Lord of the Dance words, are, are absolutely beautiful. Tis the gift to be simple, tis the gift to be free, tis the gift to come down where we ought to be. Isn't that great? Good words to meditate on for these Covidian times, aren't they? And at the end of the verse, they talk about turning, 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 um, until you find where you ought to be. So that's both obviously a reference to Christian repentance and those kind of ideas, but also just to the physical act of spinning around and the joy that it brings. So this gift to be simple was very much at the heart of the project and was wearing around in Copeland's mind when he started the ballet. And the interesting thing is that if you know this score, um, and if you don't, you're in for a treat, but if you know this score, you know that that gift to be simple hymn and its six variations don't come until about 20 minutes in. And the whole piece is, I don't know, 25 minutes from memory. Uh, so right towards the end, actually, it's, it's part of the final third, you know? Um, and that's all the more effective. Um, it's amazing, actually, how he brings all these episodes together. When I think of it, there's tender episodes and they're you know, boisterous dances, folk tunes, everything under the sun, really. And yet he manages to make it feel coherent. And right until that moment where you have the shake of him at the end, sort of crowning it all, really. And that coherence is also... I think it belongs to the title. If you think of Appalachian Spring, you think of natural processes of seeds growing up and becoming uh, beautiful trees or whatever. And that's very much at play here. You know, we get this, just a simple seed, two notes, which will be the formation of so much of the material to come. So, with this chord, right, let's go back to how it actually begins with that serenity, the mother looking back on a, a life well lived. Those two chords are taken from this chord and that one. Okay. An A major chord and an E major chord. Now, I'm not going to go too deeply into this, but all you need to know is that those chords are a fifth apart, and it's the most perfect chord in nature. It almost symbolises nature because it's the most... Um, frequently recurring interval in nature, this perfect fifth. Uh, so it's, it's a deeply consonant interval and it's a deeply consonant combination of, of colours and chords. Oh, 
Yeah, I often improvise on that chord in various different shapes. Can you still see me? Sorry, my screen went blank there. Um, over the top of that, then, the flute, first of all, gives out this wonderful melody. I love that shape, don't you? It, it just starts with just hovering up there and then dips and then wonderful wide open intervals. You know, it's, it's just joyous. And the trumpet intones those, those really important two notes that we hear right at the beginning. Okay, so we get this slow unfurling, essentially, at the beginning of sound, and instruments are used mainly in a solo capacity over a sort of lightly scored strings. It's, it's delicious on the ears. It really is. It really is. We come to rest on that. And then the first violins and violas just barge in rather boisterously. springing around like the opening to a square dance or something like that. It's all very rustic. Um, and that heralds a new, very rhythmic, robust section where you get this rhythm, which ends up being the main rhythm of the work. So it's not just about core intervals, but also about core rhythms that hold everything together. It's, it's wonderfully exuberant this first dance and um, it has just over the top of it so we've got a busy that kind of busyness in the strings and broad over the top of it Beautiful uh, melody there. And that symbolises Eden, the ideal home. Um, again, we're using open fourths. Need I say what a beautiful that is, interval that is to express Eden, you know? Um, so remember that because. that shape will come back again and again. And it sort of evolves at one stage into the love theme. Because at the centre of this story is a young couple who are about to get married. Um, so this notion of Eden and their young love uh, is kind of conflated and, and, and brought together rather beautifully just by the shape of the melodies. So um, where else did I want to draw your attention to. Oh yes, now you remember that Eden uh, melody. It comes back again in the most hushed tones, a little bit later. And what Copeland does so well is that he sort of has these incredibly busy, energetic dances contrasted by moments of reflection. And he does that throughout this. He dovetails them so well. And you get the Eden theme tune now in a different key, a sort of flatter, more mellow key. Stated in the lower strings, you've got just uh, the violas divided and the, the cellos are also divided and the double basses. The violins come in. Oh, just, is that beautiful? Is that just me? Over the top of it. You've got a, a flute just dancing around, quoting in this gentle way, just an echo of the dance that has come before. So really beautiful writing, so spare, so transparent, you know? You can really hear every single detail. And I think that's part of the reason it wasn't just a popular hit, but it was also 
a hit with the critics. They recognise the craft. They recognise the instrumentation, the orchestrational genius that was going on uh, with the writing here. So um, it's not all about sunshine and light. And thank goodness, because we need a little bit of contrast, right? Uh, we can't be sort of smiling all the way through the work. So there is a moment where there's a prophecy of trouble and strife, essentially, within the relationship, and an echo as well of the fall of Adam. Um, because it seems that these levels of narration seem to, you know, work alongside each other. You've got the symbolic, biblical, allegorical story going on as at the same time as the, the young couple finding love. So here we get um, the horns come in, they just snarl. It's marked here, cuivre. Okay, so it's a really strong, I can't do it on this piano, but they go nah, like that. Um, a really tight sound. And then the strings. That kind of language. And it's the most dissonant language that he uses. Um, it only lasts for about, you know, two pages, um, but it's enough just to give some shade and some shadow um, to an otherwise ebullient and beautifully positive, bubbly piece. And it doesn't get bubblier than this, actually. Actually, that should have been because it was piccolo. Um, very bright. This episode that follows that fall of mankind and prophecy of, of darkness. This is, uh, these are the children celebrating, uh, coming out to play, basically. And it's, it's a very playful episode, as you can imagine, with the instruments chasing themselves around the school. Um, and it gets wonderfully busy. And in fact, what I noticed about this is that it's it's more about rhythm than anything else so this is where the dance element really comes to the fore um, and he'll do things like mix meter which is to say he'll have a one time signature in one bar and another in the next so you'll have you know so one two three four one two three four five one two three four one two three four five that was one of the difficulties actually as a conductor learning this score is that no bar is the same in this episode. And there's quite a lot of uh, interesting little things to trip you up. Um, it's a wonderful celebration of rhythm, as I say. And in fact, at one point, um, it's just pure rhythm. In the strings, for example, you've... Well, let's start with the, the wind. They're just going... Really, it's kind of hammering it out, actually like that, and underneath in the strings. Like that. Um, I'm told, or I read rather, that there was actually in the ballet school a whole episode of quite minimalist writing where um, it was about you know, pure celebration of rhythm. And I think an element of that has come through in this little episode here. I would love to hear that minimalist bit actually in the original. I must look that out and perhaps the more keen and enthusiastic of you might do the same. Okay, so we have this celebration of rhythm and it all builds up. I don't know if you can see from my score, but it's getting pretty busy. Everybody accenting and sort of having these joyful offbeat accents actually. Da, da, dee, da, dee, da, dee, that doesn't sound offbeat until I do it like this. So I go one, two, three, four, one, two, one. What's it? What are we? In? We're in four. Okay, so one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. You know? That kind of thing. This brings back great memories. Can I just say that? It's it it's just so energizing to work on. And, and to bring alive, you know, to work with terrific musicians to realise this score. I think the ensemble did the 13 instrument version recently in March, so you might, this might be fresh in your mind. So, if you remember, what have we got at roughly this stage? 
through the school. I've got about 20 minutes in. You might not realise. But now comes, only now, comes the quotation of uh, the gift to be simple. And it's given in the clarinet, a lovely sort of folkloric um, sound, isn't it? And around it, just simple octaves, just very clear notes around it. So everything's sparkling and everything's twinkling. And each instrument has a go at it. And we start with one instrument, that clarinet, and then the oboe comes in with a bassoon, so it's a duet. And then there's three or four of them, and it builds and builds until the piano. And the piano is always a sort of an interesting colour in most of Copeland's scores. He uses it in a very sort of inimitable way. Actually, people do try to imitate it, but it's never quite the same, I find. Um, you have this sort of... It's up here. So it's just dancing away, very staccato, very short. And underneath that you have... Who would play that, do you think? The trombone, actually, joined with the violas. The violas get a great part in this. I don't know if any uh, Bristol Ensemble violas can sort of confirm that for me, but it looks to me as if they're... They have a whale of a time in this school. Anyway, that's a lovely... It's led, really, by the trombone, that sound. Uh, it's marked solo cantabile, singingly. I love the fact it feels as if they're going at, you know, half the, the pace of everything around them. So just this, this sense of breath. Um, there are six variations. And what's beautiful is that, actually, they're grouped in two threes. So the first set grows, as I've said, you start with a solo, it gets louder and louder and more sort of spectacular in a way. And then you have another group that um, of three, where this time the excitement's in the rhythmic build-up. Uh, the brass here start, and it's sort of trombones and trumpets just fifing away. Marked vigorous, um, so I always looked forward to uh, hearing that. And it ends in this broad statement of the Shaker hymn with the entire orchestra. I think not for the first time because they've all been playing before, but it's the first time they've just sort of sat back and given it, you know, full welly. Uh, so. <laughs> Feel the piece could end there, you know, something like that. But actually, Copeland's favourite shape when he wrote ballets was to start with something quiet, go to the climax, and then come back to a quiet, serene place at the end. And he does so, so touchingly here. So after that massive sort of full choir version of the hymn, we get the strings marked P, 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 really, really quiet. And it says, like a prayer. So this, this kind of solemn moment where they realise what they've achieved and they're sort of uh, holding the marriage up to God almost at this moment. And it's a sacred moment. Actually, this is a less sacred uh, thought, really, or metaphor, uh, or parallel. Um, I watched Witness recently. Uh, it was an eye player and a classic 80s film. I hope you know it with Harrison Ford and Kenny McGillis. And there's this one scene um, right in the center where uh, the, the Quaker community where Harrison Ford has ended up build a barn for a new married couple. And they build it from scratch, right from the framework up to the cladding. And it takes, you know, there's lots of glasses of lemonade, but right at the end, right at the end, um, you get this wonderful moment as the sun sets. They walk away from this completed building with a huge sense of satisfaction. And it's, you know, commemorating the new life of this couple. And I, I have that image here. I noticed that I'm sort of beginning this is a transfiguration moment <laughs> i hope the sun won't reach my beard but let's see i better get on okay so If 
few dodged notes there, uh, which I apologise for. So just um, you might want to write in about that. But you get the sense of how serene it is. Uh, you've got to imagine that played in the most hushed tones possible. And how does he finish? Well, first of all, we get a quote of the love tune um, and the, I suppose, that Eden psalm tune. As they come to rest, they remember the symbolism of it all. And it feels like Eden. Home feels like something amazing and out of this world. And finally, we come to rest on this note. Which, ladies and gentlemen, is a C. And C, in a way, C major, is the simplest of all key centres because there are no sharps or flats. And above that, we have a clarinet marked to play with a white tone. So this very sort of pure sound without any vibrato. And then what do we get? wonderful chord with which we began and most beautiful of all this duet using the the quietest most delicate sounds available in the orchestral palette a harmonic no less on the harp not an actual note but a harmonic of a note the ghost note and a very very quiet tap on the glockenspiel simplicity itself. So I hope you enjoyed that and I hope you'll want to go off and explore the score either for the first time or again and uh, thank you very very much for joining me. Hope to see you again. Bye bye. Thank you very much and I hope you really enjoyed that. A huge thank you to John James there for giving such an inspiring and enlightening uh, talk about Aaron Copeland's Appalachian Spring. Played it many times and uh, it's such a wonderful piece to play. You do feel like you're playing one of the 20th century master works. Uh, next uh, recital we have is on Friday and that's coming from Oslo and it's by Petter Richter, a wonderful guitarist. And he'd be playing works by Lully, Dowland, Barclay, Saw and Torega. So that would be a lovely, really gorgeous uh, recital to sit back and listen to. Thank you very much for tuning in for today, and we will um, look forward to you Friday. Keep well. Bye. <laughs>